how to study in medical school. Whether you are in med school, you have dreams of going to medical school, or you're about to start medical school, in this video, I'm gonna teach you the top 10 study tips slash hacks that I use to survive and sometimes even thrive in medical school. These tips are also applicable to pretty much anyone studying college or grad school. I think you'll like it. If you're new around here, my name is Dr. Jake or Dr. Goodman. I'm a psychiatry resident doctor in my second year of residency. I wish that I would have had a video like this when I first started med school. It really would have helped. The current me was not there to help the past version of me, but I am here to help you now, so let's get started. Number one, create an effective learning environment. A study palace, whatever you wanna call it. It's a space that you control free of any distractions and defend this study palace against all enemies, i.e. distractions. If you've ever seen The Office, there's an episode where Dwight creates mega desk. I had a mega desk in my, in my room uh, in medical school. It was a C-shaped desk that I had refrigerator full of LaCroix behind me and snacks, a calendar on the wall, and it was my little office. And uh, that's where I studied pretty much for four years in medical school. You can do a private room at home or maybe a cubicle in the library. I mean, I know plenty of people, my wife included, who was not my wife at the time, was my best friend. It's a story for a different day. She used a cubicle in the library and pretty much stayed there throughout all of medical school. It's pretty unrealistic to think that you can just study anytime, anywhere. You got to create a designated study space that encourages concentration. And then you go back to it every single time you need to study. It really works. Finally, start with eliminating or at least minimizing any sort of electronic distractions. Like I see so many people have their phone out on Instagram while they're studying. That's not going to be a good move. Trust me, you need to focus on the task at hand and eliminate any sort of distractions. I actually recommend having the electronics work for you, not against you. So there are apps on your phone that can help you with concentration and avoiding distractions. And so my thing was when I was in medical school, I was on airplane mode from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. People just knew that I was not gonna be around during that time because I was studying. If you texted me, I wasn't gonna respond. I was gonna respond later at night when I was done studying. So find a designated spot, create your study palace. Number two, the Pomodoro method. You might've heard of this before. The Pomodoro method or technique, it's a time management method that was developed by this guy Oh, I think I know his name. It's like uh, Francesco Sorello or something like that. Anyway, this guy developed it in the late 1980s and I actually made a TikTok video about this probably like two years ago when I first started on TikTok. I'm gonna play that video here because I think it's gonna do a better job than I can right now at describing what the Pomodoro method is and why you should use it. So watch this. What's up guys, today I'm gonna to teach you the study hack that I used in college, in medical school, and in my MBA. It's called the Pomodoro Technique. What it is is that you put your phone on airplane mode, you put a timer on for 25 minutes. During that 25 minutes, you focus on nothing but the task at hand. One task, you're studying. When that 25 minute timer goes off, you take a five minute break, throw on some headphones, close your eyes, relax, listen to music, do not think about studying. After that break, set a 25 minute timer and get back to work. This is something you can do over and over again without getting too exhausted. The Pomodoro Technique is gonna allow you to focus on one thing instead of the millions of things that we have going on in our lives. So good luck, please comment below if you have any questions and please follow me for some more videos like this. Okay, so why has the Pomodoro Method become so popular? Well, think of it like this. If you're working out at the gym and you're doing bicep curls, as you can tell, I've been hitting the gym pretty, pretty hard recently. Just kidding, I, I actually have just been doing kind of cardio. It's hard to work out in residency. Anyways, when you do bicep curls at the gym, you're not gonna be doing a thousand curls without stopping, right? Your biceps are a muscle and they need time to rest and recover. Well, your brain is also a muscle. It needs to recover after times of stress or times of strain. And studying for med school requires a lot of brain power. You need to rest your brain in between these sets. That's kind of how I think about it. It takes a lot of practice and discipline to master the Pomodoro method, but once you do, you'll be shocked at 
basically how long you can work without feeling like you are absolutely depleted, without feeling like you've ran some sort of mental marathon. I've been using the Pomodoro method for probably a decade. I used it for four years in medical school. Actually, no, I used it for four years in college, four years in medical school, and in my MBA. So I used it for nine years and I still use it to this day. All right, so <laughs> number three, mnemonics. Difficult to spell, but so useful. You've been using mnemonics since you were a child. They're just like tricks and mental hacks that help us remember things. It can be like rhymes or uh, acronyms, visual cues. I'll give you an example. Like a pretty basic elementary example would be I before E except after C to help you spell correctly. But I'm trying to think of one for med. Oh, I just thought of one for med school. There is a type of arthritis called writer's arthritis. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And the acronym for writer's arthritis is can't pee, can't see, can't climb a tree. What that means is that in writer's arthritis, you develop a like a joint pain and swelling. It's triggered by an infection, typically chlamydia. At least that's what's commonly tested. That sort of joint pain goes throughout the body. and It's like stiffness throughout the body. That's the can't climb a tree part. And there's also discomfort when urinating, that's the can't pee part. And then there's eye inflammation that can occur, that's the can't see part. So that's how people remember riders. Can't pee, can't see, can't climb a tree. So I'm gonna share with you guys a, a little bit in a few minutes in this video, a, a really great study resource that makes really great use of mnemonics to help you learn and recall information. And it's something um, that I was able to utilize when I was in medical school and I think you'll like it too. Number four, use a question bank. From day one, I recommend using a question bank. It's actually one of my only really regrets in medical school is that it took me so long to discover the value of using a question bank. I really cannot express how important this is. If you're gonna take one thing away from this video, please take this away. And by the way, I didn't really explain what a QBank is. QBank, it's like what all medical students call a question bank, right? It's hundreds, sometimes thousands of board style questions that simulate a USMLE board exam or any type of board exam, USMLE, United States Medical Licensing Exam. You take three of them. I have another video talking about USMLE, fun times. Basically, it, it simulates these questions and it helps you learn how these questions are asked and why the correct answer is correct and the incorrect answers are incorrect. So why use one? Well, it's probably the best way to learn. One of the best ways to learn. You can start preparing yourself for board exams earlier in your training. I would recommend pretty much from day one starting to use one of these. I started during my second year and I wish I would have started way earlier. I'm about to show you a great resource that utilizes these question banks and helps you internalize the massive amount of information that you need for medical school. Another thing that's important to know is that these practice questions are not necessarily just to check if you've learned the material. I used to fall into that trap and thinking like, well, I didn't learn this yet. I, I don't wanna take this practice question. These questions help you learn the material. You really should utilize them to your full advantage. So I just got kicked out of the library for being too loud, so. All right, we're back in my office, number five use flashcards. Use flashcards strategically. In the initial weeks of med school, I'd suggest that students start to learn about electronic flashcard apps like Anki. Flashcards are not just for kids. They're actually one of the most efficient ways to study and internalize all the information that you need in medical school. Flashcards are flexible, especially these electronic flashcards basically enables you to organize the information in different ways. So you're able to increasingly focus on the information that you're weakest at, prioritizing your study time. Once you know the information, you can move on. You can put those flashcards in a different category and you can focus on the flashcards that you've been getting wrong. You need to spend your precious time in medical school working on the information that you have not yet internalized and memorized. This practice is known as confidence-based repetition. It's basically a derivative of space repetition and it has been significantly proven to improve memory memory performance. Spaced repetition based on how confident you are in your knowledge of the material is one of the most effective ways to learn and recall information. Repetition is how we hardwire our brains to remember information. Flashcards are a highly effective means of repetitively reviewing information until we have committed it to memory. Now there's a cue bank that helps you learn and expands upon your learning by tying in relevant videos that utilize mnemonics. I'm gonna walk you through how I actually use them by stepping through a question bank tool from TrueLearn and show you how they partner with Picmonic, a visual mnemonic learning tool that I use throughout medical school. Individually, 
each of these resources are an incredible asset, but when you use them together, it's like the ultimate study hack to help you ace your exams and continue the pursuit of your medical goals. Since my specialty is psychiatry, we are gonna do a psych question. All right, let's do it. A 32 year old man comes to the emergency department after a ground level fall. The patient was shoveling snow and slipped on the ice. He now reports left arm pain and limited range of motion. While talking to the nurse, the patient asks, do you have any potions that can help my pain? I don't like taking Western medicine. The patient is oddly dressed and refuses to change into a hospital gown. He does not use alcohol, tobacco, or illicit substances. He lives with his parents and he currently works as an accountant, but he's unhappy because of the dress code at his work. His vital signs are stable. The patient is alert to person, place, and time. He resists examination of his left arm due to pain. Radiographic imaging of the arm is ordered, but the patient refuses imaging after stating that, quote, x-rays will just make me worse. However, after the physician explains that radiographic imaging is safe, the patient agrees to proceed with imaging. This patient's behavior is most consistent with which of the following diagnoses? A, delusional disorder. B, paranoid personality disorder. C, schizoid personality disorder. D, schizophrenia. Or E, schizotypal personality disorder. So the first thing I like to do is just basically use the process of elimination to weed out all the answers that I know are incorrect. I know that A is gonna be incorrect because Delusional disorder is it's characterized by the presence of one or more delusions and it has to last for at least a month or longer. So what's a delusion? A delusion is basically a fixed belief that persists even in the presence of evidence that would dispel the delusion to prove it as incorrect. An example of a delusion is if I said the sky is green and the grass is blue and you showed me that the grass is green and the sky is blue and I still was would be unwilling to accept that, that would be considered a delusion. Basically, we could convince this patient that x-rays were a safe procedure despite his initial reluctance to allow imaging. So a patient with delusional disorder would probably not have changed his thinking. He would have stuck with the fixed belief. So it's not gonna be delusional disorder. B, paranoid personality disorder. This disorder is characterized by a strong mistrust of others. It's really unlikely that this patient would have trusted the physician enough to even agree to an x-ray. So, so it's not gonna be B. C, schizoid personality disorder. A lot of people confuse schizoid personality disorder with schizotypal personality disorder but schizoid personality disorder is like a voluntary social withdrawal and limited emotional expression so while he expressed that he's unhappy with the dress code at work there's nothing here that really suggests that he has the desire or need to isolate from others so i don't think this is the correct answer let's cross it off and let's keep moving d schizophrenia so basically the diagnosis of schizophrenia requires at least six months of two of the following symptoms delusions hallucinations disorganized speech disorganized or catatonic behavior and negative symptoms such as flat affect or apathy or social withdrawal. Though the patient's appearance and magical beliefs may be perceived as odd, we don't really have any signs of these symptoms here. So D is unlikely, we're gonna cross off D and that leads us to answer E. Let's see if we're correct. Let's go ahead and submit schizotypal personality disorder, answer E. Nice, well done. It's E, schizotypal personality disorder. Now let's scroll down and see how this collaboration between TrueLearn and Picmonic reinforces the learning process. So you can actually see when you scroll down, there's a Picmonic video related to the question that you just answered. Remember schizotypal personality disorder with this sketching type of person who carries around a disordered personality purse. Diagnosis of schizotypal personality disorder includes significant impairments in personality functioning, beginning with impairments in self-functioning. These people are often socially awkward, shown by the social book Awkward Face. The next category includes impairments in interpersonal functioning, which includes individuals being mistrustful, shown by missing the trust fall. This can also encompass having impairments in empathy and intimacy. The last category includes pathologic personality traits. Individuals with this personality disorder may present with eccentricity, the egg-centric costume, which is defined as an odd, unusual, or bizarre behaviors or appearance. They may manifest with magical thinking, the magical wizard, which can include bizarre thinking and speech, the bizarre speech bubble. Individuals may act highly suspicious, the suspect that's been sketched up. Lastly, individuals may seem withdrawn or detached, shown by him detaching from reality. Picmonic is masterful at using mnemonic tricks to help internalize the massive amount of information that are required to pass your board exam. Also, when you review the results of your test, you're going to be provided with detailed explanations of symptoms, diagnoses, and basically how to use that information to determine why each answer is correct or incorrect. 
You'll also see how your answers and your test scores compare with your peers using these tools. You can also review or retake your test to gauge your progress. You can see how TrueLearn and Picmonic can be invaluable resources in med school. If you want to learn more and try the TrueLearn QBank with Picmonic integration for yourself, head to the description in this video. All right, let's move on to number six of my top 10 med school study tips. So number six, consider forming a study group or at least finding a study partner. I think this is really important because it keeps you accountable. Meeting up with your classmates to go over course material can keep you accountable. Teaching others is also a proven learning strategy to enhance your own understanding of a concept. They say that the best way to learn is to teach somebody something. It also improves morale, support, you get insight, you get friendships for life sometimes. And studying in med school is just super intense and really only those who have been there can really understand. So my study buddies to this day are still some of my best friends from medical school. Now there are definitely risks associated with study groups, i.e. a chatty Kathy, somebody that just talks and talks and talks and prevents you from studying. So you wanna make sure you avoid people like that, at least in your study groups. You also don't wanna fall in the trap of hanging out and then not really studying because you're supposed to be studying. Hang out later. All right, number seven, protect your time. Manage your time outside of class. And basically, number one, decide if lectures are even worth it. From my experience, no. I actually stopped going to lectures. They were recorded. This saved me hundreds of hours. I would basically watch the lectures on two times speed at home. You know, that's how I learned. I have no regrets about doing that. And lectures just were not for me in my medical school. And they may be for you. Basically, everyone's going to feel like there's not enough hours in the day. But everyone has the same amount of hours. We all have the same 24 hours. You really wanna build a strong routine. And that's all about working smarter, not harder. I basically treated my med school life like it was a nine to five job. And when I say nine to five job, I more so mean like seven to seven, sometimes longer, seven to eight. But when you're done studying, you're done studying. You go home and you know that you basically you've done everything you can for the day. And that's like an amazing feeling. So treat it like a job, develop a routine. All right, number eight. Find a mentor, find somebody who's a year or a few years above you who you can trust. Somebody who studies like you do, somebody who lives a life like you do. If you enjoy hanging out with your friends on the weekend or you enjoy traveling, make sure your mentor is not somebody who studies 24 seven and is gonna make you feel inadequate or feel like you're not studying enough. Mentors help with study guides, research opportunities, and just general advice and insight. It's probably one of the most underrated tips in this video. Finding a mentor is key. And before starting a new class, ask your mentor about it. This cuts a lot of the BS work in the beginning when you're trying to figure out what to read, what not to read, how to study for the tests, and then pay it forward. Make sure that you find a mentee and mentor them. Number nine, don't be prideful. And what I mean by that is don't be afraid to ask for help. If you find yourself struggling in a subject area of study, don't be afraid to look for help. Your school may have free tutors that can help out and make your life a lot easier. I've, I've used tutors before with really good results. My college and medical school had free tutoring services. So take advantage of every resource your school has to offer. Number 10, this is definitely the most important. Take care of yourself. Med school can be physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally draining. Make time for yourself. That means eating healthy, getting exercise, getting enough sleep, and carving out some time to do things that brings you joy. I know all those things I listed are easier said than done, but you just gotta do your best. And if things become too much, don't hesitate to reach out for help. I wish I would have reached out for help more when I needed it in med school. Whether it's the support of family, the companionship of friends, or just taking advantage of the mental health resources that your school provides, or seeking professional mental health assistance. Remember, you're not alone. Many medical students struggle with depression, anxiety, and mental health issues. You are not alone, I promise you. Well, that's my top 10 list for surviving the rigors of med school and study tips that can help you along the way. I hope this video was helpful for you. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if this resonated with you, hit the thumbs up, share it with a friend and consider subscribing to my channel. If not, no worries. I appreciate you coming out anyway. Good luck on your journey. You got this. I believe in you.